Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Stalls TV Ask the Educators Live. Today we have a, a great audience coming in with a bunch of questions to get answered, I'm sure, and we have a few Stalls TV educators that I'd like to introduce to you who will be helping with your questions throughout. First, we have Zach Ellsworth. Hello. And then we have Courtney Kibitza. Hi. And I'll be helping as well. I'm Josh Ellsworth. So a little uh, housekeeping, I guess. Over in the right-hand side of your uh, computer screen, you should see the GoToWebinar flyout window. and You can use this window to chat in your questions throughout the presentation. Jody Edgar will be helping us by directing those questions in throughout the session. And Jody's live on air with us as well. Hi, Jody. Hi. So uh, feel free to type your questions throughout. And we're just going to kind of get things started with a uh, general overview of Stalls TV um, as you're questions are starting to flow in. So Stalls TV is excited to announce the new StallsTV.com. If you haven't visited the website yet, we'd encourage you to go out to StallsTV.com and register for free access. And we'll undoubtedly be pointing you there today uh, to answer some of your questions. There's hundreds of videos that you can access on demand. And then of course, you can sign up and see our full live event schedule by clicking in the top right of StallsTV.com. So with that, we'll turn it over to Jody, and we'll start kicking in some uh, different questions from our viewers today. Uh, first one we have is uh, from Mike. I'm having a tough time getting people to my web page. Any suggestions? Okay. Um, so we'll kind of work on the formatting here. Does anybody want to? Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. Having a tough time getting people uh, to your web page. A lot of times, and we experience it ourselves here. With our business, sometimes we think we build a web page and people are just going to show up and start placing orders. Um, some suggestions would be um, look, visit Google. They have lots of information that you can learn for free about analytics, about keyword searches, about search engine optimization, uh, keywords that you can use in your industry. Um, you want to set up a Google local shop. Make sure you have your shop, especially if you're selling locally or regionally set up and indexed on Google. That's a free service there. So if you just visit google.com, I believe it's slash places, you can put your own business in there. It'll take you a couple weeks because they send you a verification code uh, actually to your physical address that you have to fill out. But getting people to your website locally, uh, use that Google places. And then you can also look into AdWords depending on what you have budgeted for marketing or how important really your website is to your business. If it is your main mode of sales, you'll want to invest some money into AdWords. Uh, but if it's just really informational, you might be better off checking out uh, Facebook and just connecting with people there. Yeah, that's a good tip. I'll add um, with that, there's a lot of folks competing for um, specific terms in our industry. So if you're a t-shirt shop, uh, embroidery, screen printing, heat printing, whatever it may be, um, there's a lot of folks competing for these search terms like customized t-shirts and whatnot. So um, another good way is just identify a niche and market to that niche. That way when people are searching under specific targeted terms, your website's more likely to come up uh, ultimately because there's less competition that's buying for that term. Um, so that's uh, just some tips for you. So hopefully that answers your question. Jody? I have another one. This one's from Travis. How do I eliminate a heat press mark on my polyester garment? Yeah, Courtney, you want to take a run at that one? Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. Um, the polyester mark that's left on your garment is typically um, happening because you're applying a transfer that's applying it too high of a heat, so it's actually burning the polyester garment. Um, so a couple ways to get rid of that is to look for a transfer that applies at a lower temperature. Um, that way it'll help to eliminate that box and won't scorch that fabric. So if you're using a vinyl cutter, or CatCut Premium Plus is a good option for that. Um, if you have a printer cutter, if you're looking for full color graphics, there's CAD prints options um, in our CAD color tech line. And then there's also um, some screen printed transfers like ElastiPrints. All of those apply at a low temperature. Um, and that typically the threshold for scorching is about 280 degrees or below. So all of those products will apply at that temperature to help remove that scorch mark. Good. Yeah, that's helpful. So the, and then I'll just kind of add on to some of these as I think of ideas and jot down notes here. Um, another way is in the sales process, if you're finding that you're seeing heat press marks a lot and your customers are having issues, uh, one of the trends that you can capitalize on is gray is the new black. So darker shades such as black are more, than, more likely than lighter shades to show a heat press mark. You may consider when you're merchandising or first approaching a client to show them shades of light gray or charcoal or ash gray as the neutral that you're decorating instead of black, and that will kind of 
guide you away from having a heat press part be an issue in the first place. Zach, you have anything to add on that? Okay. Good. Thanks, Travis, for that question. And go ahead and throw in the next one. Uh, this one's from Tony. I have a BN20, which I bought from Zach, that I use for printing heat press vinyl. I also use Sizer's Easy Weed and Straight HPV. How does Stahl's HPV compare to Easy Weed? And do you have a comparison short to cross uh, referencing Easy Weed to Stahl's HPV? Okay, so HPV, I assume uh, heat press vinyl or heat transfer vinyl, which is kind of the generic overarching category for all the um, heat transfer film products that are out there on the market. So Easy Weed is certainly a, a great product. Um, and we have a lot of customers that uh, utilize that product at some point and then have moved over to stalls. I would say are comparable uh, that I would recommend trying first if you're looking for a direct comparison would be Fashion Film. Uh, they're both similar as far as sticky backings, both hot peel, both apply at a similar time temperature and pressure, similar colors available. There's a couple big differences. Uh, the biggest of which is we manufacture product and sell direct, whereas Easy Weed is available through distribution. And then also Fashion Film has more of a matte finish, whereas Easy Weed has a semi-gloss. So that's really a matter of your customer's preference. If they prefer a matte screen print-like finish, then Fashion Film's worth a look. Um, and then, of course, uh, all of our colors are one price point, so you can get neons, metallics, and everything uh, at the same price point. Now, that's if you're looking apples to apples. If you're looking to print performance wear, which has been an interest of somebody else here with getting the heat press mark, we'd call out Premium Plus. So rather than using a product like Easy Weed or even our fashion film on performance wear, if you want to venture into these other fabrics, synthetic fabrics, look at Premium Plus versus Easy Weed, and you'll start to see some big advantages with the low temp it presses at, um, how it feels on the garment, and ultimately how it stretches and performs. I think that covers the question. Um, it's interesting because the, the BN20 is another thing, so I don't know if you want to cover some different digital medias to help Tony out with the BN20 as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. Um, as far as the BN20 goes, uh, along the same lines, there would be two recommendations that we would make material-wise. If you're printing standard t-shirts, 100% cotton, 50-50s, we would recommend that you look at Express Print along with the uh, Medium Tech Magic Mask that goes along with that. It's 20-inch wide material built specifically for the BN20. Uh, it also works on the larger machines as well. And then if you're going to be decorating a lot of performance wear, we would say to look at the tech line. So there's super tech, opaque, uh, which is really stretchy, great for performance fabrics. But most performance fabrics require some type of um, dye inhibiting feature on the product. So uh, look at our super tech subla stop. Again, available 20 inches wide. We do the manufacturing as a charcoal backing to where it inhibits some of the dye migration that you would see on performance polyesters, especially the reds, the dark greens, the maroons, those types of things. So I would look at those two products, the Express Print and the Tech Line. Thanks, Tony, and congratulations on the BN20. It's a great device, and it should be presenting many opportunities uh, for your business. What else do we have, Jody? Uh, this one's from Monica. Is pressing on a polyester polo shirt the same as pressing on a dry wick material? Okay. Courtney, you're a performance wear resident. You want to give yeah, that one a I'll shot? go ahead and take that one. Um, so if it's 100% polyester, even if it's a polo shirt, it more than likely has some kind of moisture wicking um, properties into it. So it's going to be the same as if you're using just a regular moisture wicking dry fit t-shirt. Um, so you could have all of those same challenges with the heat printing box, um, especially as you're printing smaller areas, depending if you're isolating the area with maybe a smaller flatten um, or raising up that print area with a, a print perfect pad or something to that nature. Um, so you may even have a few extra challenges with the scorch mark there using those types of items. Um, if you're using a, a polo shirt that's maybe 50-50 cotton and polyester, then you probably won't see those same issues because um, it's got the higher, contact, the higher cotton count to it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Courtney was trying, saying there that on the small area specifically, if you have a certain pressure on that heat press, um, let's say it's a 5 on one of our presses or 50 PSI, and that pressure is distributing across a 16 by 20 platen, um, you're getting a certain pressure, but as soon as you raise a specific area or switch out to a smaller platen, smaller amount of square inches, that pressure is applying all down to that small location. So you're actually getting a much higher pressure on that polo left chest placement than you are on a full t-shirt. So for that reason, just make sure that whenever you press these small areas or raised up areas that you retract the pressure 
accordingly, and that'll help get rid of the heat press mark as well. Uh, Monica had a follow-up. Okay, what yeah. is the best material? For, um, uh, I forget the, was the it CAD cut or was it transfer? Polyester polo shirts. Okay, so not, um, Monica, can you type in specifically if it's a, if you have she a vinyl cutter? Yes. She has a vinyl cutter? Yes. Okay, so we would recommend CAD cut premium plus. Applied at 280 degrees for eight seconds at a medium, a light to medium pressure. Okay, I have another one here from Dawn. What should I look for when hiring my first production employee? Any takers? That's a good question, Dawn. Um, what should you look for when hiring your first uh, production employee? It's uh, Well, congratulations on, on looking for an employee at this point that you've grown so much that you need to bring somebody in. It's not just you uh, running the shop. But when you're looking for your first uh, production employee, what, what we always look for, what I always look for personally, is someone who is willing to learn. Uh, we have, there are all kinds of resources out there from the t-shirt forums to Stalls TV to whoever it is that feels like they has some uh, input, but you really want someone who's willing to learn because as you continue to grow your business, whether that's through different decorating technologies, through different materials or finishes that you're gonna bring in, you're gonna need somebody to really dig into the details of those materials and technologies to uh, get trained up and be able to produce things efficiently and well for your customers to where you're not putting out bad products. So first thing I would definitely look for is somebody who is absolutely eager to learn and willing to dig into the details of things. As you probably know, it's extremely important to understand the production process and the materials that you're using to get successful prints and uh, make customers happy. So that's one thing that I would definitely look for. Anybody else have uh, an opinion on that? Yeah, I would throw in um, our industry is a very creative one. And if they're going to be completing a task uh, such as selling, well, it's production. So let's say weeding heat application. I think somebody um, that's creative or crafty is always a good place to look. Um, also detail oriented because of course when you're heat printing, if they're working the heat press, you want to make sure it's straight. There's laser alignment tools that we have that can help with that, but you want somebody that's going to take the time to be detail oriented as well. Those are just some, some quick traits I would look for. Jody, any more uh, questions there? Yes. This is from Robin. Uh, she wants to know about glitter. Can it be layered? Um, she has used it and used Cut Studio software to layer it and have and not have two layers on top of each other, but she has uh, see, seen other people layering it. Okay. Courtney just did a class yesterday here on Stalls TV uh, about layering, so I'll let her take that one. Um, I'll go ahead and take that. So layering glitter flake is kind of a tricky one. Um, we don't recommend it to layer directly glitter on top of glitter. Um, you can layer glitter on other type of heat transfer vinyls like fashion film um, without any issues there, but directly layering the glitter over glitter, the textured, um, finish of the glitter just isn't going to allow it to really grab down and adhere to it the way it would a garment and those types of fibers. Um, so for that reason, we don't recommend it, um, especially if you want it to last the 50 plus washes that Glitter Flakes recommended for. Josh, I know in your CADWorks class you had some creative ways to get around that. Do you want to share a few of those? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really, uh, you can do two things. You can do a garment gap, which uh, leaves a little space in between the overlapping layers of glitter so you don't get the same visual appearance as a full uh, glitter on glitter um, layering job but garment gap is one really easy way um, the second way is called trapping and that's where you're actually weeding the background out of the background weeding the inside out rather of the background layer so the the foreground layer fits directly in almost like the pieces of a puzzle and that gives you the full bling on bling look that I think you're going to but there's some additional weeding costs uh, that are involved. And now I know there are some uh, companies out there that are recommending uh, glitter for layering. Um, in my experience, in the products that I've used and wash tested, uh, none of these products will last 50 cycles glitter on glitter because you have the textured particle uh, that Courtney alluded to. It just does not allow good adhesion. Do we have the class available where she could watch how to do those things? Yeah, if you want to, can you switch over to my computer screen, uh, Jody? All right, so this is my computer screen over here at the desk, and um, underneath the broadcast archive, there is a video called uh, Making CADWorks Live Work For You. This would be one place on stallstv.com under broadcast archive where you can learn about the actual um, art setup process with our free online designer, uh, CADWorks Live, and then Courtney's layer class will be published by 
this time next week um, as well on the site so you can review that. Thanks. Okay, Jody, next uh, question. I have a Graphtech CE6000, and when I use vector cuts through cadworkslive.com, it is cutting the opposite than what is on my screen. Is length and width, how do I correct this? Yeah, so I have a Graphtech in here, but it's not, it's not on or plugged in. That's all right. Um, so it's a setting in the Graphtech, actually. So if everything's kind of reversing um, the box, it's pretty typical with a standard vector cut installation working with the graph tech. So you need to change something on the graph tech menu uh, that's called rotation. I believe it defaults to being on and you need to turn it off or perhaps vice versa. But you go into the menu setting of the graph tech, I believe it's under area, and you can change rotation from off to on. And that should help your graphics uh, be set up properly from vector cuts when you see them. Now would the, um, would the properties in CADWorks in the vector cut be able to be changed as well and affect it the same way? In vector cut, you can. Um, so, shoot me back to my computer again one more time. Let me just—I'm going to drop something just on the screen real quick in CADWorks for an example and send it over to vector cut. Um, in vector cut, when you go to the properties of your particular cutter that you have selected, there's a cutter orientation option that you're seeing here. If you drop that down can change it from the x-axis east and the y-axis north to the x-axis north and the y-axis west. Um, so there's three options here. But ultimately, if for some reason when you change the rotation on the device it's still not cutting correctly, you can change these particular settings and try to send a little sample cut. But there is a combination that's going to get you cutting uh, properly. And then also, um, just while the screen's up there, on the right-hand side, you can change your material settings to match the direction that you're cutting as well. You can manually change those, right, on the right-hand side, your page page size. Um, go ahead. Show me where. Right here. Yeah, to, to match the material size. Right. What you mean? Yes. Correct. Yeah, you can pull out the material size and, and have the, yeah, the when you're using vector cut, I may have overlooked the question, when you're using vector cut, you can't read the size of the material directly from the machine. The USB cable doesn't work the same way it does with the GraphTech um, software. So you'll need to manually look at your control board on your GraphTech and actually punch the dimensions into the width here within vector cut. So I'm Okay. Jody? Okay. Often after importing and vectorizing the image, it uh, doesn't have crisp straight lines, why doesn't CADWorks Live have a NOD editing? NOD editing? Yeah. Yes, NOD okay. editing. Okay, so yeah, CADWorks is a design program, but it's not um, as detailed for NOD editing as, say, a CorelDRAW or Adobe Illustrator. Um, so typically, if you're working with very low quality uh, JPEG or bitmap art, raster art that you're trying to turn into vector art, um, in, uh, CADWorks does not do a good import and vectorize of it to make it cuttable. Um, you'll have to take it into a Corel or an Illustrator. Unfortunately, node editing is, isn't something that CADWorks currently does that's at least exposed for you all to work with. Um, but there is a solution. It's called Artbark Express. If for some reason you can't get a good trace and ultimately you, you don't have another option, you can upload it to our Artbark Express site and uh, pay a fee and they'll do a, a hand trace for you if, you if you don't have Corel or Illustrator or a graphic artist that you can utilize. Jody? Um, this one's from Keith. Will a heat press logo last as long as a screen printed logo? If not, about how long do they last? I just got a GraphTech cutter and a Hotronics heat press to add to my screen printing. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll take the lead on that and you guys can jump in. Um, so screen printing is obviously one of the most traditional methods of decoration that, that people are familiar with. And uh, when it comes to heat print logos, as long as you follow the recommended application instructions and you have accurate time, temperature, and pressure, which your Hotronics machine will read for you, congratulations on that, on that purchase, uh, on that investment. Um, as long as there's accurate time, temperature, and pressure, the materials that Stahls manufactures, we test them up to 50 washings on the shirt, which would be comparable to what a screen print wash finish would be. 
So yes, heat transfer will last as long as a screen print finish based on our testing as long as your application is correct. Yeah. Anything yeah. to add to that? The only thing I would interject as long as you're using a good heat transfer. So um, there are different qualities of transfer products. Um, at Stalls, we lab certify 95% of our stuff up through 50 cycles, but there's always that foil product where people just want the look or that transfer paper product from like a desktop inkjet or laser printer. It's not going to give you the full scale, but if it's CAD cut, if it's a, a CAD cut that's not basically a foil based CAD cut, if it's a screen printed transfer, exactly, you're going to get the same durability uh, you can expect from a screen print, direct screen print, as long as they hit time, temperature, and pressure accurately. So Hotronics Press will certainly deliver time, temp, and pressure accurately. Just make sure you have the right loading and pressing techniques that your item's flat. Ready? Right, Hi, this one's from Brian. Will the leg sleeve platen work on the auto clam heat press? Courtney, you're up. I'll take that one. Um, so no, the leg and sleeve platen technically won't work on the auto clam if you're looking to completely split open all of your items and thread them, especially if the sleeve tends to be um, narrow, maybe on like a lady sleeve. Um, they can be made. The pins on the bottom will drop down into an auto clam. Um, so if you're just plan planning on like laying the item on top and not actually threading it, you can certainly use it on there. It just won't give you the full threadability for all of your items. Yeah, the footprint is just too wide on that, so it won't allow you to split that sleeve or that leg and thread it completely over. So you're better off. A solution, though, is a, a leg and sleeve heat printing pillow that you can use with the, with the auto clamp press. Ready? Yep. Uh, this one's from Frederick. What would be the best material for sneaker embellishing? Well, we have, um, you can check out Stalls TV. Uh, we do have a video on how to pull off that. I believe, Josh, that you use uh, most traditionally fashion film as the CAD cut product to decorate sneakers. So we would recommend our fashion film product with the matte finish. Again, it would apply mostly to the left or the right side of the sneaker. If it has a collapsible heel, you can load it onto the shoe platen that we have as well. But fashion film would be the way to go for that. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, if you go to the Stalls TV webpage, basically under the how to print section, and under items, if you click more items, you'll get an option to click into shoes. And there's a whole session here that's about four minutes long that uh, explains to you how to decorate footwear. And we show you fashion film in that video, and we also point out other keys like the right platen and the flexible application pad to ensure that the shoe doesn't melt. Okay. okay. Um, next one is from Ron. In your opinion, what's the best equipment investment I can make? Stalls equipment. Yeah, I'm wearing the Stalls right? equipment shirt, so I'll take that one, I guess. In my opinion, what's the best equipment investment you can make? It really, it really depends on a lot of different factors, and um, if you'd like to have, you know, the question answered specifically for you, we'd be happy to help you with that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I'll just give you an, an overview kind of uh, opinion on that. So if you have um, the market to sell to and the money to invest, one of the most successful investments that our customers make is in a print cut unit, whether that is the BN20, the BS300i, whatever that is, the reason being it gives you the ability, um, and that's actually, I jumped the gun, I'm assuming you already have a heat press, uh, because a heat press is actually probably the, the best investment that you can make first, because it's the smallest, and it gives you the ability to contract out a lot of the transfer printing, and you can decorate a lot of stuff. So moving past the heat press, the best investment, in my opinion, would be a print cut machine. It allows you to produce full-color graphics that can apply to basically anything from, um, you'll be able to sell your customers' decorations on walls, floors, doors, uh, windows, t-shirts, shoes, you name the item, uh, stalls manufacturers or, or sells uh, a material that you can uh, personalize that item with. So uh, heat press first. If you already have the heat press, I would recommend if you have the money, a print cut machine. Um, just to throw in the vinyl cutter there, it accomplishes the same thing as a print cut machine does. You just don't have the full color options. So that's, that's my opinion of what the best investment is. Any other opinions? No, I was just laughing because I just read a post on uh, Ted Stahl's blog. It's just tedstahl.com for you that aren't subscribed uh, to it. But uh, a lady that we met at SGI New Orleans commented on there that uh, she hasn't bought a vinyl cutter yet from the show. But she said that, I feel like if you don't have a vinyl cutter, you don't have a business. And so it's just um, interesting perspective. It's like a heat press and a vinyl cutter are assumed anymore. And then you start to look at the higher cost 
um, higher return print devices like print cut or DPG, uh, sublimation, some of the other output, but definitely got to have the heat press, get started, learn the products, and then a lot of things you can do from there. Okay, Ready? Next question. Uh, Brian wants to know, I've purchased uh, multiple rolls of material, which is nice, but I'm looking for suggestions on how to store them or organize them rather than them in the, the box they came in. Do you have any suggestions? Um, heat transfer material suggestions? Um, yeah, you should see our office. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you'd be asking us. We're not, we're not experts in that area quite yet. But no, seriously, though, there's the uh, floor racks or the wall racks that you can get that you see in most uh, traditional sign shops um, that will hold, I think, 44 rolls of vinyl, and they have smaller ones as well. Um, there are some new options that mount a little more um, in line or uh, up against the wall so they're not taking so much floor space. Um, of your shop, I believe they're called the uh, graphics rack. I saw a press release on them in Impressions not too long ago. Those are really nice, but a um, little limited about how many rolls. But those are two good options. And then, of course, you also have the option to just uh, have a filing cabinet to store them in. And if not, a lot of folks just utilize the boxes. They dip in, cut the top off, and lay them flat on some sort of shelving system so they can see everything and kind of keep them segmented in four or six packs, whatever it might be. Any other suggestions? Do you guys have any? Uh, uh, material storage isn't something that I'm strong at. So. <laughs> well, I've seen and I've been into some shops that are home businesses, and a lot of times they'll utilize the, if they're out of a spare bedroom, the under the bed space, where they have literally all the rolls yeah. shoved under the bed so the room's still functional, but yet they can pull out rolls and see what they have. He uses a pegboard. Pegboard, yeah, so good. Um, here next one, uh, Keith would like to know. There is no eight by ten quick slip lower platen protector. Uh, will one be available soon? Eight by uh, ten right. quick slip. Yeah, we've. Um, I guess the opinion here has been through some of our experiences. Once you get below um, eleven by fifteen or something really long that you need to slide your item onto, uh, we haven't developed the quick slip protectors for them because a lot of times you need that um, rubber pad kind of grip the item so it doesn't fall off the press and it stays loaded. Uh, we certainly could custom make uh, an 8x10 cover, but I don't foresee us having a stock one uh, anytime soon. But if you're interested in a, a custom one that you have to have for some reason from experience, we're happy to get you a price on that. Okay, uh, another one's from Jake. Uh, we work with Thermofilm almost every day. Lots of local schools use Royal Blue. It seems like that color is a little bit harder to cut and weed. Then other thermofilm colors, do you know of any reasons why this may be? And PS dolls is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, that one? Okay. Sorry. I'm making a note here so I can follow up and find out, out as well with Jake, right? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, we read the, I personally read the, the customer feedback and the stuff that's turned into our customer service department, as does our product quality lab and everybody. Um, every day, every month. Um, I haven't seen this particular concern um, escalate or bubble up to a level to where we're getting repetitive uh, complaints. So, Jake, I'm just going to, if it's okay, I'll follow up with you offline, um, just see if that's been consistent. Um, basically, the step will be, we'll make sure it showed up in various lots of material, not just isolated to one lot number on the roll, to make sure it's not an anomaly and that it's something consistent. If it is consistent, we will uh, spend the time with the product testing lab to go back and reference the peel force numbers on those rolls that we test when they come in to see if those are reading high or out of our uh, specification. Uh, we'll make sure we get you happy, and if there's a product quality issue, we'll correct it. Thanks for the stalls is the best comment as well. All right. Bob would like to know, it looks like mold is coming through on my finished print. Why does this happen? Um, I think that's, I've seen that before, it looks, it's like, I think it's dye migration, people mistake it for mold, um, so I don't know if either of you want to talk a bit about dye migration in general and explain. Yeah, so um, I'd assume also that it's probably dye migration, it happens often on polyesters that are um, either dyed in the manufacturing process and not cured properly or just sublimated fabric, so especially if you're seeing like a dark color, maybe a navy or a dark green, um, or something like that, and the colors are starting to come through and really change the white of your design um, and any other colors, and it's going to be um, dye migration. And dye migration typically happens um, in polyesters because of the way that they're dyed, but basically when you um, heat them up under the heat press, the fibers open up and the dyes from the manufacturing process or from the sublimation process 
are then able to come through the transfer. Um, and it happens not only under the heat of the heat press, so if you've sent it out to your customer and it came back to you that way, um, it could have also happened in the high heat of a dryer or in a duffel bag inside of a car or anything like that, especially if it's a jersey. So you want to look at products that are going to um, inhibit or block the dye migration, especially if it's on just a regular polyester garment like a red football jersey. Um, and those products, if you're using a vinyl cutter or traditionally a CAD cut thermofilm, um, or if you have ordering transfers and numbers, CAD cut thermofilm is a good option for that as well. Um, we recently launched um, the Sublistop sub product that Zach had mentioned a bit earlier. And that's really great for any full color logos, whether you're printing them yourself on a solvent ink printer or if you're ordering transfers from stalls in their CAD prints line. Yeah, so basically if you decorate a dark polyester, look for a product that inhibits dye migration. Um, and then the other option is with industry suppliers now, they are um, releasing garments that are guaranteed not to bleed. So the other option is look for a supplier like a Sanmar that carries a product, they call it posi charge, which means that it's a polyester, yes, but it's a polyester that's not going to bleed through the print. The sort of molding look is definitely dye migration. You either need a product that blocks migration or you need to change your blank to something that's not going to migrate. Ready? Uh, Robin would like to know, how long does a roll last storage-wise? I think um, under the proper storage conditions, which means not exactly um, any very high heat or, or humid area or not extreme cold, um, there's an indefinite shelf life. I mean, if you had a roll that's been sitting on the shelf for seven, eight, ten years, I'd probably start to be concerned. But if it's five years or less, you should be just fine uh, to use that product and get the same durability that you would get as if it came straight off the line. Um, Brian has a question. Does the vinyl blade automatically adjust to the right angle when you first load it onto the cutter? Good question, Brian. Like that one. Um, it, as far as the actual um, degree or angle uh, of the blade goes, most of the cutters uh, on the market, you're going to have a 45 or uh, 60 degree blade. Uh, and it depends on the manufacturer what you really need to set. When you load the blade, it's going to be loaded to cut right because most of them have a magnet in there and it seats the blade and you'll hear it seat and it's ready to cut. But the problem that you have to worry about is what your offset is set at uh, specifically on the Roland and the GCC vinyl cutters. So on the Roland and GCC cutter, you want to make sure your offset is at 0.25 millimeters for the 45 degree blade, and you'd be at about a 0.4 for a 60 degree blade. If you have the GraphTech cutter um, in the software, you actually tell the machine which blade holder and blade you have loaded, and it takes care of setting the offset for you, so you wouldn't really have to do anything uh, with that one, as long as you have it set. If you have the blue tip blade holder, you just tell it you're using the blue tip with a 45 degree blade, and it, it takes care of the rest for the graph tech. But um, as far as the actual blade being set in there, mostly magnetic, so it shouldn't have shouldn't have any issues there, just seating it in. Right, and most cutters are um, drag knife cutters, so as soon as that cutting head starts to move that blade on the X or Y axis, it's going to kind of uh, reorient 